Hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence Mack, and I'm a MAKEMO librarian with LA County Library. I welcome you to Finding Credible Health Information. This program is supported in whole or in part by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act, administered in California by the state librarian. Okay. And also to note, a link to the recording of this presentation and the slides of our presentation will be emailed to you next week. So don't worry if you miss something in this presentation. Okay, and now let's move on to our event, uh, doing Finding Credible Health Information. And our presenter today is Oleg Kagan. Oleg is the library's community engagement coordinator, and he will tell you all about finding credible health information. Oleg, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Lawrence, uh, for that introduction. And hello and welcome, everybody. As Lawrence mentioned, I'm the library's community engagement coordinator and also a librarian. And some of you may be aware that as librarians, part of what we do is help folks evaluate information. And so what we're going to be doing today is that writ large. We're going to be talking about a very important topic, one where the stakes are a lot higher than a lot of other information that you evaluate, and that is health information. It's going to be a fun presentation with examples and a lot of ideas that you can easily glom onto, but that will take you far when it comes to evaluating information. And there's a lot of information out there. So let's get into it. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about health information literacy. And this is the definition of health information literacy. What I want to do here is just also foreground a few parts of this definition. So separating the scams, misleading information, advertisements, and false claims out there digitally and in real life is a skill. Just as recognizing a phishing email, and you may be aware of phishing emails, that's when bad actors send you an email and it's made to look like an email from a bank or a hospital. And you click on a link and then it sends you to a fake website where you enter your personal information and now bad guys have it. Recognizing all of those things is a skill. Of course, health information tends to be weightier since it's based on centuries of scientific advancement. Most of us aren't doctors. But when it comes to evaluating claims online, we don't need to be medical experts. Instead, we need to focus on the criteria we'll discuss today against whether we see and determine whether something is likely to be harmful or helpful. So here are the objectives for today's presentation. Encourage critical thinking and reasonable skepticism when encountering health information. Learn the basics of what to look for to determine if a source is reliable or unreliable. And at the end, we'll provide you library resources and beyond the library resources to help, help you further your quest for reliable and current health information. I just want to bring up the term reasonable skepticism here, because as I mentioned, we're not medical experts. We don't need to be to apply the tenets of information literacy to health information. Our job isn't to prove or disprove claims, just determine what our next steps are. And I mentioned at this at previous presentations, and I want to echo this too. We don't need to determine whether something is true or not. Typically, we use the clues that we have, the clues that we'll be talking about in today's presentation, to weigh whether something is more likely to be true or less likely to be true, and then what to do about it. So unless we're, you know, I should say, if you're put into the position of having to tell somebody whether some a medical claim is true or not, back away from that. You know, we don't have to be the ones doing that. So here's an example of some health information that many of us see in our 
everyday lives. You might get an email, a text message, a Facebook message, or somebody might just tell you this in person. Something like uh, this message on the screen. It says, hi, son. Danny's dad told me his inside source at the CDC is being forced to hide data proving drinking red beverages causes chicken pox. And then there's a sad emoji. Uh, there's a, a sick face emoji. I know your kids like that fr fruit punch on occasion, but pour it all out now. He sent me a link to his website that he only sells green beverages. It's www.greenishealthy.com. I just bought a few bottles. It's expensive, but he says it's worth it. He says it'll help you hold your breath underwater for longer, too. And I know how much my grandkids love going swimming. And then there's an emoji of uh, lungs and somebody swimming. Love you, mom. So, this is an example, and this includes a lot of the things that we'll be talking about in the future, and we'll break it down once we get through those examples. So why is health information literacy important? Knowing what's factual, of course, lets us make informed choices. Each of us have to make health choices on a fairly regular basis, even if it's just deciding what to buy at the store. It helps others navigate information. So you might need to help somebody else, somebody older, younger, more or less informed than you, or at least more or less informed on what we're talking about today, health information literacy. Making good decisions saves you money and time because nobody likes to be at the other end of a scam where you, you bought a very expensive health product with all kinds of outlandish claims and then you drink it and you feel the same way as you did before. And then, of course, health information literacy is important because once you get to the end of the advice I'll be giving today, you'll know that at that point, you probably need to ask for help from a credible resource. So let's talk about choosing sources first. And we're going to be going through each of these things to watch out for with some examples so that when you see them, you'll recognize them as sources that may not be looking out for your best interest. So let's start with outrageous claims. Oftentimes, when we see health information online, particularly misleading or incredible health information, the claims are outrageous. They sound too good to be true. They, they talk about how they can fix complex problems just in the snap of a finger. And it's so easy. You'll see terms like scientific breakthrough, that something is an ancient remedy or it's a secret ingredient. Now I'll tell you, if something was an ancient remedy, isn't it weird that people haven't been using it up till now? And isn't it weird that only one person is selling this secret ingredient, this panacea, or something that heals everything? We want to be aware when and raise our heckles a little bit, raise our flags when we see claims that just seem to go beyond common sense. Likewise, we want to be aware when we are encountering high pressure sales techniques. And nobody really likes these kind of sales techniques because they stop you from being able to go, wait, what? The person that keeps talking or the commercial keeps talking, trying to convince you, trying to act right now. And when that happens, you don't have time to say, wait, hold on. I need to actually ask somebody else. I need to do some research. Can I ask you a question? Because they just keep talking. Also, you'll often see that people will use techniques to try to make you feel like something is urgent. They'll use, for example, that a, a product will sell out soon, that this price is only available right now. If you don't act now, then it'll be gone. It's especially funny when you see that on TV commercials, because those commercials might be running for weeks and weeks and weeks, but they claim that price is only available now call now for this special offer. Another example that you often see these days is you'll say this product, product, product information, and you need to buy it now or it might be shut down by the government. You know, it's, it's 
targeting a specific audience for people who are a little nervous about the government or distrustful of the government. Of course, this product is in opposition to what the government wants. So it makes it feel like it's more important that the, and that the, the person is sharing information that's so important that the government is trying to shut them down. Sometimes the government is trying to shut them down because the information they're sharing is simply false. You'll often see ambiguity in misleading health information. And this we saw this in the text message that we saw earlier. Um, we'll, we often see this when the source is hard to verify or prove that you can't even get to the source. So it's like in that in that message, and we had the example on screen, my friend's friend posted on Facebook that the FDA said, okay, but where did the FDA say it? When did they say it? Is it on their website? So if you encounter ambiguity, you, you want to go, okay, well, the FDA said it. Let me try to search this on their website. And you'll often find that there's no mention of whatever incredible or urgent claim they're making anywhere on the FDA or CDC or any other public health information website other than the one they put up, of course. Um, you also get uh, claims that are difficult to prove or disprove because the item that's being sold to you may be similar to what something else does. Or for instance, if there is a claim that this solve or this ointment makes cuts go away, it's not like somebody's going to go, you know, somebody gonna have a cut they'll put on the ointment. It's not like they're gonna cut their other hand to be able to see and prove for yourself whether the ointment is the one that makes the cut heal. Humans heal, of course, um, faster or slower. And you're not going to be able to have a control group to test that ointment. And of course, we want to consider the motive for whoever is providing the information that you're seeing. The profit motive is one that we're all aware of and one that's especially insidious. You know, somebody is selling a product, you know, they're making money. That's not a, that's not a, a big deal in itself. But when it comes to health, where the claims are sometimes difficult to prove and it's important, are they trying to profit from promoting something or from getting you this information? Are they telling you information so that you buy this thing so they make a lot of money? You know, maybe, maybe it's something to think about. Another consideration when it comes to motive isn't just money. It's also fame. It's also stepping up their credibility in some other field. So maybe they have a product and they want to they want to eventually appear on Oprah or something. And so they might be that might be their motive in trying to get their product out there regardless of whether the product is actually useful. So, and the final source is material is the fake or misleading headlines. This is another red flag that we wanna we wanna have here, uh, because you'll see fake and misleading headlines out there. Sometimes the source that the headline is coming from is notorious for doing that. Sometimes it appears in regular newspapers like the Observer, and here we have an opinion. Uh, article from the Observer. This is this goes back to when COVID was a lot more at the forefront of our thinking. So I, at this point, I don't think we were we were at home anymore. But the we get when the vaccines started coming out, uh, there were there were a lot of deceptive headlines and misleading headlines, and of course people posted them on social media and they got many, many shares. And so you had a headline like this and th there was a, I think this is a, a tweet about that headline. Am I reading this right? Why most people now who now die with COVID in England have been vaccinated. Now that's just a, a strange sentence because it could mean a lot of different things. And so one could assume when reading that sentence, and I think that that's what this person was responding to when they said, am I reading this headline right? is that there's a connection between getting the vaccine and dying of COVID. And of course, that's not actually accurate. When you click through in the article, what the article actually says 
is that because most people have been vaccinated, there sometimes people who get vaccinated actually do um, die from COVID. And this is something that we already knew. This is not, so it's not, it's not because they got vaccinated. It's in spite of being vaccinated, it's not actually a large amount of people. And so in, th in this situation, when you see something like that and you may just go, huh, oh, that's weird. That's not, that's something that's different from what I was thinking before. You make sure to click through the article and read it yourself to see if the hot take on Twitter or Instagram or whatever social media platform you use, whether that the poster's hot take is actually specific to that article or, or actually what that article says. Because you get headlines like this and it makes you think all sorts of things. So let's now go back to that text message that we saw before and consider the things that we've been talking about and how it relates to that text message. And I don't know, I, I kind of want to ask, have you received these kind of messages before? You know, whether it's a, a via the phone or text message from a family member, a friend, a stranger. Have you seen these kind of messages on Facebook or coming into your phone or any other social media platform? And I'm going to read it again, just so it's just so because it's, it's pretty small on the screen. Oh, somebody wrote in. Oh, yes, absolutely. They've seen they've seen this kind of stuff. And if you want to post in the chat, if you've seen this kind of stuff, if you want to post examples, I'll be happy to see them. So I'm going to read this again and then I'll, I'll highlight what we're talking about. Hi, son. Danny's dad told me his inside source at the CDC is being forced to hide data. So the inside source, again, ambiguity. How, how would we check on that? You know, we'd have to go to the CDC website. And if it's not there, you know, the inside source is somebody we can't ever actually know about. Is being forced to hide data. And we didn't talk about this, but humans love this kind of drama. It, it draws us in because all of a sudden we're finding out something that's a secret. So if you if there is drama associated with health information, that's another red flag. Being proving that drinking red beverages causes chicken pox. Now that's a pretty outrageous claim. That's something and you know, we chicken pox has been around for quite a while. And it goes above and beyond common sense that drinking a the color of the beverage you drink has anything to do with chicken pox. Now, I know your kids will like, like that fruit punch on occasion, but pour it all out now. And then he sent me a link to his website that only sells green beverages. So there's a profit motive there. He made this claim and now he's giving a solution and it costs money. I just bought a few bottles. It's expensive, but he says it's worth it. He says it'll help you hold your breath underwater for longer too. And I know how much my grandkids love going swimming. So here we have one of those ambiguous claims because we're not going to be able to test. You know, most people don't test how long they can hold their breath underwater and then they'll drink this green stuff and then, and then test it again. So you won't really know if they'll be able to hold their breath underwater longer also. That seems like a very strange claim to tack on to something that's supposed to uh, prevent you from getting chicken pox. You know, the combination, the connection of the, the lung, lung strength and chicken pox just is not exactly there. Oh, somebody wrote in the chat, blood sugar pills to control blood sugar. And it, it came through Facebook. Yeah, so diabetes is a, is, a, is a big one. Lots of misleading health information on that. And sometimes when you see misleading health information, it'll focus on things like sugar, fat, you know, these kind of carbohydrates, you know, the kind of big things that we all know a little bit about, but they'll start getting deep into how, you know, don't do this, do that, you know, blood sugar pills, you know, because it's, you know, controlling diabetes is, is a real problem. So a lot of people will come on and go, well, can we make this easier? And they'll see claims that say yes, but those claims are frequently not accurate. So let's talk about how we can choose sources. When we see sources, what we need to be looking for. So first of all, 
we need to be looking for verifiable data or information. Just like that ambiguous source of the inside source at the CDC or FDA or wherever my brother's uncle's dog's cousin uh, posted on Facebook about something, that's not very easy to confirm. What we want from credible health information is a source that we can click to and we can actually see the article or we can actually see a citation that then we can find again. If it's, if for some reason, a uh, bit of information so where somebody posts something is deliberately obscuring or where the, when the source is obscure, that's not good. We want to be able to read the actual study. Now, and that's not saying that the actual study will be completely, absolutely true. And then there's good, there's better or worse academic journals, of course, and there's articles that make claims with more assurance and less assurance. Oftentimes that's written into the article itself because scientists tend to be really careful about making claims and then saying they're 100% behind their claims. They'll usually say, well, this is pretty accurate. Our study is, is methodologically sound, but you know, there's still a lot left to study and we don't, we're saying this, but we're not actually saying this thing. You know, we're just we're just saying that our study is proving this little bit, and we've got to be aware of that. And sometimes when you, if you go to a study, you know, you go to the discussion section, that's where you'll see that. In the, and then you go read the conclusion, the conclusion will say the same thing, but there's way more research to do ahead. That happens often, especially with a ever-growing and consistently changing field like medicine. So then another is reliable source material links. So it's similar. We want all our sources to be confirmable. And we also want reliable links um, or references to source material. Sometimes, and I'll show you this in an example in just a bit, when we have, we have certain websites, articles, and they're all linking to the same thing. They're all linking to other websites created by that person. And so it gives you the impression that these articles are well sourced when in fact, it's just all the same, the same kind of echo chamber of sources. And that's not very good because, it, because then, you're, then you're getting your information, you're getting your confirmation from just a few people or even just one person. And we want to be able to get our confirmation or, you know, we want to be able to check those sources. We want to ch check those claims by looking at many different uh, voices. Of course, a very important voice in this should be your doctor. You know, oftentimes we might be afraid to ask our doctors things. You might not feel like they have time to answer our questions, but indeed your doctor is probably your best source for medical information, at, at the least of which is because you can talk to that person. You can actually, you can have an actual conversation. When you look online or some, you see a source or somebody's making a medical claim, you won't be able to go, well, but hold on a second. With your doctor, you can bring in something and they might go, oh, well, this is not right. And then you say, okay, well, why can you explain? Can you explain it to me? Doctors tend to have medical training. So in they have a degree. So you know that they've at least had some medical training. They will go through a residency. They often have years of experience and they'll offer you their opinion. You're their patient. So they want you to get better. I mean, they most doctors, hopefully, don't want, they, they don't want to see you over and over again. They want you to, to go out there and be healthy. Now, here's a cautioning factor. You know, doctors in the traditional medical establishment can be wrong. You know, research is happening all the time. The medical establishment is ch changes their opinions. You know, they tend to revise. And that makes sense. You know, we learn more and we revise. And so if you're not sure about what your doctor is saying, or if you're not completely, if they're not giving you the time, or not explaining in a good way, that's a situation where you want to get a second opinion, but you want to get your second opinion from also a credible source. Now, there are some people who say, but yeah, but, but, you know, the traditional medical, everybody's right. Everybody has a motive and everybody's influenceable. It's true. But I would say that if you needed an opinion about say an Italian restaurant recommendation, that is something that's much less as much less at stake than your health. If 
you needed an, an Italian restaurant recommendation from a friend, would you listen to the friend who went to culinary school, a focus on Italian cuisine, that has worked at multiple restaurants, that has spent years in Italy studying and learning the food? Or would you trust the friend who says, oh, yeah, I'm half Italian and has been, I've been eating spaghetti and meatballs since I was a kid. Clearly, I think you might, in that situation, trust the friend who has had a lot of experience with Italian food. And that person will be able to adjust their recommendations based on the context you provide. You know, how serious are you about this recommendation? They'll be, they'll be able to get down to your level and explain why a restaurant is good or bad. It's the same thing with, with the doctor. You know, your, your friend might have some experience in the medical field or might read a lot of books about medicine, but they may not be the best person to give you definitive advice. So let's get into some examples now. And I've been talking, giving you a lot of kind of conceptual information. And I want to show you some examples of actual posts online. So here's a post, this post looks like it's from Instagram. It's, I'll read it to you since the text is small. It says fat burning drink. And it's a picture here of what looks like orange juice. Drink 30 minutes after each meal. Drink one cup every morning or evening. And then the text here says, are you looking for some boosters to include in your weight loss journey? Try these best fat burning drinks to help you lose weight fast, especially belly fat. You can either try this recipe and have it three times a day for three days, or check the link in my bio to start the 21-day smoothie diet challenge. And there's a smiley face with the tongue out. People who take the challenge lose up to 20 pounds in 21 days and form long-term healthy eating, hashtag healthy eating habits, and help them keep the weight off for good. Join them today. Check the link in my bio for details. And so when I see this, I go, okay, maybe, you know, yeah, you know, you, juice, orange juice is good. But the claims here are really vague. There's a lot of ambiguity in what they're saying. And the claim, the big claim they're making is that these drinks will help you burn fat or will help you lose weight. And then I see, okay, you can, people who take the, the challenge lose 20 pounds in 21 days. That's 20 pounds in less than a month. Now, that there is an outrageous. That's a lot. I think from what I've read, losing one pound a week is a healthy amount of weight to lose. So when you say, oh, I could you lose 20 pounds in 21 days, that really hits to a problem that a lot of people are after. A lot of people want to lose weight because they associate weight loss with health. And so 20 pounds in 21 days, that's great. But is it really accurate. I mean, it's promoting this unrealistic goal while also trying to sell you something. Well, I don't know. It might work, but I would look at that claim and go, mm, I don't really believe that a, a simple juice can do that, or it's unlikely. Now, of course, I mean, you look at this claim and you think, well, you drink it in the morning, or drink in the evening. Sure, you drink juice. It's going to make you less hungry. That, that makes sense but you can drink any juice. You don't have to buy this juice, which is probably a lot more expensive than any other juice that you see out there. But mostly what I see here is outrageous claims and ambiguity. How would we really test this beyond what they're saying? Let's look at a website that provides good information. This is the Mayo Clinic. And I had somebody mention the Mayo Clinic in the chat, and I'm glad, I'm glad you know, because the Mayo Clinic is really an excellent source for health information. You will not find outrageous claims at the Mayo Clinic. You'll just find straightforward information based on credible health knowledge by accredited people. So here we have a page, and this is a, this is a question and answer page in their consumer health section and says, my dad take collodial silver for his health. Is it safe? And the answer is from a doctor, Brent Bauer. There's an, he has an MD. And at the end of the article, he cites sources from which he took his information. So he's an expert, but he also cites other sources. And we like that. You know, we, that, That's the kind of thing that we look for.
So here's another uh, Instagram account. Now this is the account of the FDA. And what strikes me most about this one, and I'll read it to you in, in a moment, is that it's just really straightforward. What they're saying is really commonsensical. There's just no outrageous claims here. They're not trying to sell anything. They're just trying to get people to be healthy. So here it, it says diabetes treatment can prevent health or can prevent or slow down some of the serious health problems that diabetes can cause. And then it says, remember to exercise, eat a balanced diet, take your medication or take your medicines. You can do it. And then there's an emoji of a, of a strong arm. And then hashtag diabetes month and DAM. I don't know what NDAM stands for or national diabetes. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what it stands for, but there's no claims here. I mean, this is something that somebody will, that anybody can look and go, yeah, I mean, this seems, this seems pretty, yeah, this seems all right. Ah, good. National Diabetes Awareness Month. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, we just had a uh, mention in the chat, National Diabetes Awareness Month is what NDAM. So I knew something like that. So yeah, this is, when you see this, you don't, you don't have to buy anything. You just, you know, it, it makes sense. And then we go to something like this also Instagram post, and you see the big letters, drugs block our biochemistry to reduce symptoms. Vegetables restore our biochemistry to create health. Now, part of this is that it might be true, or at least partially true. It's just really vague. We have two big claims in, this, in the image of this post. We have a picture of vegetables there. Drugs block our biochemistry to reduce symptoms. Some drugs might do that, but that's a really general statement. And then vegetables restore our biochemistry to create health. Also, I mean, we generally know that vegetables are good for us. That's, a, that's just a fact. But whether they restore our biochemistry to create health is another really general claim. That, yeah, I, I guess they do that. Um, and there's nothing really wrong with that. And then the post in question says, this statement may seem fairly simple. No, it doesn't. See, it's not simple to me. Uh, but during times like this, and this was posted during COVID, we tend to forget the basics of what we know inside the panic. For every symptom, there is an herb or fruit that can support the body and heal us from the root out. And then there's hashtags daily reminder, COVID cure. That's the one that really got me, COVID cure. You spread awareness, not fear, health, wellness, support the body naturally. And so what this post is doing here is it's trying to make you think that you can eat vegetables or use herbs to cure COVID. And that is a very, very, very far-fetched claim because most of us are know that fruits and vegetables, while they're good for us, they're not necessarily in the same sort of category as medicine. And so while they might have curative and medicinal value, they're not gonna cure COVID. So you see something like this with these vague claims and this kind of sideways view of how medicine works and how COVID works. And this is the kind of stuff that you've got to just go, mm -mm, nope, not going to get into this. Here's one that actually looks is it looks pretty nice. I mean, it's this is a, a company that sells honey. I don't actually remember what the company is called. I, the picture looks nice. It's a honeycomb with a bottle of honey and some uh, plants in the background there. It's, it looks really nice. Um, the text says, before the days of vaccination, and there's an emoji of a needle and somebody crying. Are they, are they laughing? Oh, they're laughing. There's like before the next vaccination, there's a needle, and they, I guess they're laughing. It's hard, kind of hard to see even for me. A few buzzworthy notes. Uh, buzzworthy. It's, it's a great pun. Notes on the ancient healing, and notes on ancient healing and pollination. And then in the bullet points, it says: since the dawn of time, hive superfoods have been used across cultures for their medicinal properties. The next bullet point, honey was actually used as a sacred offering and healing tool by the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. And then the next bullet point is about 90% of flowering plants rely on pollinators for fertilization. That means without the bees 
flowers may not have the chance to bloom where they're planted. Now, for the most part, I got, I have no issue with this. You know, honey, it, it, it may, it, I mean, it's a fact that, that honey has been used as a sacred offering and healing tool in the past, you know, since ancient days. Um, and it's, it's a fact that uh, bees help flowers grow. It's, it's what they do. And it's, it's, I Im imagine it's a fact that since the dawn of time, hive superfoods have been used across cultures for their medicinal properties. Now, these things are all, I don't think they're, they're necessarily disputable and they don't need to be disputed because that's not necessarily what, the, what this post is trying to do. It's just trying to sell you honey. Now, what I don't like and what, what, what's, I say, what, not so much what I don't like exactly, but what raises red flags for me about this post is that it puts it in context of vaccination because it almost puts honey as a, an alternative to vaccination when indeed it's, honey may have healing properties, but not those, not the same kind of healing properties. You know, it's it's kind of vague about what it's doing here. And so when you see something like this, you know, just because honey is, has healing properties doesn't mean that it can replace vaccines or that it, it works in the same way. So we got to be aware of these kind of things that, that, that these this subtle framing that happens in in slightly misleading medical information or posts. But eat honey by all means. Honey's great. And here is the LA County Public Health website. Um, this website changes. This this screenshot was taken from from a while ago. Um, it, it's when when we first presented this program, I believe, is October. So, October SIDS Awareness Month. Click here is the is the link in the middle. And SIDS, of course, is sudden infant death um, syndrome. So there's information about that. Now, what one notices about this website in comparison to some sites that have outrageous claims and misleading health information is that the site is really not flashy at all. It's it's really straightforward. It, aesthetically, it's really pretty plain. It's not trying to sell you anything. There's lots of links to resources and resources that are then sourced from other places that are backed up. And contact information is readily available. So if you want to get in touch with the LA County Department uh, Department of Public Health, you can absolutely do that. And there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of information on the LA County Department of Public Health website. It's publichealth.lacounty.gov. Now we'll be sharing this these slides with you, so you don't have to write that down now. If you miss the the web address, you you can always open the presentation later, and you'll be able to click on the links in there. So if you want to actually go to this specific website, or if you want to just find out the main website of LA County Department of Public Health. And of course, you can just type in LA County Public Health into Google, and you'll it's, it'll be the first site that comes up. And I've just got a few more of these to show you, but it's these, these are important because this is the kind of stuff that you'll see. And this one here is especially deceptive. Now, this is this is a post that talks about a study. It's a CDC study based on 14 clinical trials show face masks do not work. And this, this is, of course, also within the context of COVID. And it says, alert to citizens, governors, mayors, presidents, prime ministers, public health officials. You want science? You always state that. Well, here is your very own science. And then it lists, it show, it's the reference to a an article from the uh, a journal called Emerging Infectious Diseases. And so you could actually look up this article. I did. It's not, not hard to find. Um, it says the journal is published by the CDC. Indeed, it is. Now, what it's saying is that it's, you know, it's saying, well, Facebook masks do not work. This, this was used as a, as evidence that masks aren't effective against COVID. But the reason it's deceptive is partially because that article really does exist. So it gives the illusion that they're basing their claim on credible information. Of course, if you actually read the article, it's not for, I mean, it's just one article. It's a survey of 14 other studies. 
each with their own positives and negatives. So it's a, it's a, it's a survey article. And it's not about COVID at all. It's about the flu and only influenza. And in fact, the authors of this article and other scientists have clarified that personal protective equipment like masks does help protect people from contracting COVID. So there are people who are using the evidence of this article, not about COVID at all, to talk about how masks do not work, when in fact the, pub, the, the authors of this article say that they do. So this is the kind of stuff that you also see. So you have to sometimes go and read the article. And like I mentioned before, read the discussion section of the article, look and see, you might have to go into the details. Now, the, the methodology of medical articles and some of the terminology can be really complex. But oftentimes the discussion section is much more approachable to the average you know, lay reader. And the conclusion section or and the abstract is, abstract is just the beginning part, the, little, the part that summarized the article is, is accessible. And here we have a whole website. Um, this is a website by uh, of Dr. Merkula. So it, this is a site that gives the illusion of being a news site, but it's really just run by this person. And its goal is to sell you products and get you subscribed. So as you can see, there's, there's a shop link at the top of the page here. And I find this part very, very interesting. We talked before about hidden data and drama. And so here we have this at the very top of the page. So this, this is a screenshot from this page. This page still exists. I mean, it's, it's out there, but they're changing their page all the time. So this is one from before. So there's an important announcement. Access Dr. Markolo's censored library now. It's censored. But who is it censored by? It doesn't say. Recent, uh, reluctantly deleted over 15,000 articles from our website, but they are now returning. So he, the articles were censored, but they were censored by him, but now they're back. So I guess you can access the, the, the censored library, but I don't know if you have to pay for it. You may have to pay for it. So what we see here is that there are news articles here. So I said, you know, there's, here's the, the censored library exclusive you get latest news and you've got these headlines and they they seem legit although i should say that one of the most annoying things about this website and let's say misleading news sites and even some good news sites is that clickbait headlines take over a clickbait headline is one that doesn't give you the information in the article it just gives you just an information so that you want to click there so for instance down here, let me erase some of this text because it's starting to be crowded on this page. So right down here on the very bottom, you have a, in the trending news section, you have an article, did the COVID shot lead to this young model's death? This is, a, this is an epitome of a clickbait headline. You have to find out, you have to click and you know, there's a young, the COVID shot, which everybody was thinking about. There's a young model. There's death. It's a pretty dramatic, suspenseful headline. And you, and when you see this on the side, you go, oh, of course, you know, there's some people who have confirmation bias, which is if something fits into their point of view, they're like, well, yeah, of course it did it. Of course it did. But you click on it. Actually, it, it didn't. Now, that article, it cites circular sources, which means it cites sources that are all within the e ecosystem of Dr. Merkula. When you find out more information about that that story, in fact, this young model had underlying conditions, had other stuff going on. It was not the COVID shot that led to her death, although a COVID shot did happen before. So there's like the idea that correlation doesn't mean causation. So just because it's something it happened before doesn't mean that it was the cause. So some just kind of the basic ideas of logic that we have to consider here. So there's a lot of red flags on this site. Drama, ambiguity, clickbait headlines, outlandish claims, all of those things exist on this site. If you have questions 
uh, now is the time to put the, post them because I'm getting to the end of the presentation and Lawrence and I are very, very happy to answer your questions. So if you have questions, if you have comments, by all means, put them into the Q&A. If, if you have stories that you want to share with us, you want us to share with everybody else of examples of misleading health information that you've encountered and that, that really ticked you off or that you fell for, you know, we we use those cautionary tales as well, and maybe other people can use them too. Post those in the chat, post, post the stuff in the Q&A. We're happy to see that. So by way of summary, navigating the abundant amount of health information available online can feel overwhelming. Absolutely. The amount of incoming information from social media, email, people around you, text messages, there's just so much online and off. But using the tools available to you, you know, what we've talked about today, you can learn to extract things that are more factual from the misleading and deceptive untruths. Again, we don't have to be the complete arbiters of what is true or not. What we're trying to do is we're trying to suss out what is more likely to be credible and then use that to make our decisions. And some resources that can help you do that online are resources like, and this, this is not an exhaustive list, these are only four resources, uh, are things like Medline Plus which is a free online database put together by the National Institute of Health, accessible to anybody. The Medline Plus has both articles similar to the Mayo Clinic, similar to the Harvard Institute, you know, the Harvard Health website, which is really also excellent, similar to the Cleveland Clinic, but it's provided by the National Institute of Health. So you'll see things about different diseases, different ailments. I um, mean, there's also a section of Medline Plus where you can get scientific articles, you know, full text, full access that you can then evaluate. And so if you if you're trying to do research aside from misleading health information online, if you're just if you were at your doctor's office and your doctor said something and you're like, huh, I wonder, you can actually type that stuff in and get actual medical information there, medical articles from academic journals. Um, Encyclopedia of Children's Health is just one of the encyclopedias that are health rated that are available from our online database. This is actually this is Gale eBooks, which is a whole bunch of reference books just right there for you, accessible at any time online. I love Gale eBooks. I actually look at it pretty often. And Encyclopedia of Children's Health is just one of the encyclopedias that are on there. Mersk Manuals, this is also an online database. You can end a physical book that you can get from your local library. And then I mentioned before, the LA County Department of Public Health website. Um, you can also access that. Um, you can also access that. These links are all clickable. So when you get this presentation, you'll be able to click on all those links. And of course, if you have questions about evaluating information, the stuff that I've talked about this present during this presentation and beyond research questions, any kind of questions, you can speak to a librarian. You can call your local library during your office hours. You can stop by the library during your office hours, come to the reference desk, talk to your librarian. You can text us from Monday through Friday from 12 to 6 using the phone number here. And then you can also chat with us online. So you can do, you know, just use your keyboard. Um, to chat with us Monday through Friday, 12 to 6. And you can do all of that at the Contact Us page on our website, lacountylibrary.org. You scroll all the way down. And on the right-hand side, there's a Contact Us page. Give that a click. And you'll see the when the Instant Librarian is open, you'll see a little box inside of the screen. You can type your chat questions in there. And my colleagues will be there to assist you. This, this program, again, was sponsored by the California State Library and funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and we thank them for their support. And now it's time for the Q&A, my favorite part of the presentation. Now, hold on, I, I, see, I see some posts in the chat. Some of these are questions, and then I see, I see that 
Thank you for the wonderful. It really opened my eyes to the massive amount of misinformation out there in the web, TV, and even magazines. This information can be potentially dangerous. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. But we are you know, sharing this information about how to get this, how to determine whether something is credible. Because oftentimes we use the stuff you see in magazines may not be necessarily harmful, but it may just be incorrect. And so we want to know that as well. All right, Lawrence is back on here. So let's let's do some questions. Oh, let's, somebody said, please go back to the previous slide. Okay, I can do that. Um, we can start the q and I'll just go back to the previous slide while we're talking. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so there are some questions in Q&A. Um, hmm, here's an opinion-based one. If you had time to search one source, which would you go to, PubMed or Mayo Clinic? I would go to Mayo Clinic because it's uh, their, their search is a little easier. I mean, it depends, really, really depends on what I was looking for. That's that's what it helps me determine which source I go to. Um, if, if I was just looking for like uh, something about a specific uh, disease, I probably, if, and if I wanted just basic information, I'd probably go to Mayo Clinic. Yeah, I'd probably go to Mayo Clinic as well. Um, I find it a bit more informative. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on how deep you want to go. I mean, there's there's a, there's a lot of good health information websites out there. Mm -hmm. Let's see, okay, next question. Um, I'm not on social media. Can you explain why hashtag plus word or words exist? Why do people use them, and where are they used? Yes, I, I really like that question. Um, so hashtags became a convention of social media platforms like Twitter. I um, mean, they're called, you know, hashtag and, and a word. They're called tags. And they made it easier for you to find information about a specific topic by just clicking on it. So initially, uh, when it came out on Twitter, and Twitter is, you know, really, it's microblogging. It's really quick you know there's i now i think it's 240 characters i don't know if i am i am i right lawrence 240 uh i believe it can be a little longer now too mm -hmm. yeah so it's basically it's just you know it's short posts about a lot of things and so people would put hashtags at the end of their posts and initially when somebody wanted to find out about like i don't know hockey um they would you know somebody would put hockey or la kings hashtag la kings and then anybody who wanted to follow a stream of tweets about the la kings within in the search box put hashtag LA Kings and they'd get all of those tweets in real time updating about LA Kings. And so uh, eventually Twitter brought that into their platform and those links, those hashtag links became clickable. Um, so then you wouldn't have to type it in. So you should click, you can just click on that hashtag. And since then that has migrated out to other social media platforms. Basically it's just a way to bring all the information together, but people also use hashtags or tags as a for rhetorical purposes. So some of the posts we met, we, we saw use those not for search, but just to kind of add a little bit more information about what they're talking about or be, or be funny or, you know, just put a little dot on or exclamation point on whatever they're saying. I don't know if I, is there anything to add, Lawrence? I think that's kind of a, a very quick tutorial on hashtags. Yeah. I think that was a uh, very, very uh, informative. All right, um, next question. Are you saying that Mercola website is not credible? Based on, the, uh, there may be some things on there that are true. I, I haven't read the whole website and I don't read it on a regular basis. So just as with many sites, parts of it might be true, parts of it might be misleading and parts of it may be completely false. I would say that if I wouldn't make decisions based on what I see on the Marcola website, primarily because it checks a whole bunch of the boxes that I would consider red flags. So I, like I mentioned, it, we don't need to be the ones to determine whether something is true or false, but based on the criteria that I've been talking about, the information on there is less credible in my opinion. 
Okay, uh, let's see. Once I check out a remedy, I receive loads and loads of sources of information from other questionable sources online. Marketing. Yeah, yep. you put in your you put your email address into a box and that email address then gets shared with other companies. Uh, sometimes that remedy is promoted by a large organization that has a whole bunch of other cures or, you know, a whole bunch of other kind of medical information. Then, then yeah, they'll share and you, you get a whole bunch of spam. It's pretty unfortunate. That's kind of how, that's kind of how that works. Be careful where you're putting your email address, particularly if the, if the website looks like it's not, uh, not great. Oftentimes when you're purchasing something, there'll be an opt-out link and that opt-out link will not be clicked or there'll be an opt-in link and you know, it'll be automatically checked. So you got to be careful to check and uncheck when you're inputting your information, whether you want them to send you emails. You know, uh, websites that aren't very user-friendly or that are misleading or that just aren't great, they won't even have one. They'll just automatically put you on their list when you sign up. And that's that's not good. That's not good web etiquette. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see. Ah, um, in the chat, um, is Helpline a reputable site? I don't know. Um, let's find out. I'm going to go to that website. We'll do a live demo here. I don't know. Have you been to the Helpline, Lawrence? <laughs> mm, no, I've not used it before. Let's go and find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my browser with you. And we're going to go to Healthline. Um, so let me just share my screen here. There we go. And I'm going to type in, I don't even know if the website is healthline.com. I'm just going to type in healthline into Google and see what, see what happens. Okay, so I guess it's healthline.com. Medical information yeah. and health advice you can trust. So it gives us some information about it. Uh, subsidiaries, so there's other information. Um, I see that um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services did partner with Healthline.com in 2017. So that might be good. Yeah. I mean, that, that that is a good uh, that is a good sign. Um, so now I'm looking at this website. Oh, good, Lawrence just posted a link to that information. So I did just post. I, I see the website. The website looks pretty spare. Um, I'm not seeing, there's a subscription link. So I'm going to click what it says. Okay, so it's just your email address. So they, you're probably going to get a newsletter. Um, they have a privacy policy here. So you can click, that's also good news. Um, there's, they're supporting MS Awareness Month. All right. So the website doesn't, it, it has a, on its main page, it's not really that litter. I don't see any ads on this website, which, which I think is really interesting. It's also a good sign. I see some uh, some headlines that have question marks, which, which is it possible to get RSV more than once? Is there a link between coffee and your eyesight? Can a smart pill help diagnose IBD? That's what a new study found. Okay, so it looks like they 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 cover studies. Let me, let's go to an article. Why it's time to shift the focus to mental health and black community? So it looks like they've got, they had some articles for Black History Month in February. So I'm, let's go. I'm just curious. Uh, how these kind of articles look like, what what the coverage looks like. So this is a question that probably people ask a lot. So let's click on it and see. Okay, so we've got, so we got the newsletter pop up here. Um, I see that there's an actual person who wrote this, medically reviewed by, so this may not person who wrote it, the person who, this article is just reviewed by this person, Meredith Goodwin, MD, FAAP. Oh, it's written by A.L. Haywood. So A. L. I don't know who A.L. Haywood is, but it was reviewed. So we can click on this and we can just see who the kind of who this person is. So this is an actual person. She actually seems to have experience and they tell us about their process. So that's good. All of these are good, uh, good signs so far. Um, this, there are good signs about this website. So I see you can get, so th it's not sensational. So I see the ad, there's an ad right here and I see, now I see ads. Okay, so it's not sensational. It's something that people ask, this is a question that people are actually asking, which is good. You can get more, so there's there's the headline here. You can even get RC pains the same season. So the answer is yeah, they answer the question right away. So the answer is yes. 
So you see there's a there's a source here. Um, spike. So if, what happens if we click here? So it goes to CDC. That's great. That's that's the kind of thing that we want. When we click on something, it goes, it, they link to a CDC website. So they, they made a claim in late months of 2020 cases of re, uh, respiratory uh, sin, 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 how do you say this, Lawrence? I don't even know. Sensitial, sensitial virus, RSV. I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm reading this word for the first time, everybody. Uh, has spiked. Um, so it's it, there's a claim, and then it cites the claim, the source for the claim. That's great. Um, cases. There's short paragraphs here, so this is this is meant for a lay audience completely. And you should be they they want you you could read it quickly because this paragraph is so short. Leading cause. So here's another article. It looks like it it's an it goes to a journal. Um, from Oxford University Press. I'm just looking down down at the bottom, and where you can see the, where the link goes to, and it's a journal from Oxford University Press, which I like. Yeah, so from this article, I'm really liking um, this website. I would say that you can get some. My initial from uh, just from reading one article and seeing the website is that you can very likely get some good information from this website, at least at the very sort of highest level. And that, that's, you know, I that, that's just from, again, looking at this very thing, there's product reviews here. So, you know, product reviews are always a challenge here. So I'm going to just quickly look at the product reviews, you know, just, just while I have you here. I'm going to look at the product reviews. So there's getting good reviews of things like vitamins and supplements is notoriously difficult because it's one of those things that's very difficult to test. You know, what do you test when you test vitamins? You test how much of the vitamin is actually in there. And so there's, there, there is criteria that exists and there are standards bodies that determine the effectiveness of a vitamin or at least have specific criteria to think about it. So I'm really curious how they do it here. So sometimes websites like this you know, they're not, it's not a nonprofit. It has ads and everything, which is fine. There's not, nothing wrong with having ads or trying to, you know, making some money from a product um, from a journalistic source. But let's see. So the best 15 vitamin brands, a dietitian's picks. Okay, so it's maybe one dietitian. So I see this written by one dietitian here and also medically reviewed by another person. So I like that it says how we chose. That's really important. Um, that's not something that you find in sites that aren't good. Good review sites will tell you how they did it. See, here it is. It means looking at third party testing certifications and brand integrity. So it's, what, what, what they're saying is that they did some of the work for you. So you can also verify that some of the items, because they tell you how they look, how they chose, you can verify some of the information. This is an advertisement, but it's labeled advertisement. And it's pretty clear here that it's labeled as an advertisement, although it kind of looks like the rest of the website because of the font. So here's how we chose third party testing. So you can go to these places and you can actually look this up. And I actually have done that because in the in the past when we did this program, somebody asked about that question and I included some information about vitamins and supplements in the follow-up email. I can I can if you want, just let me know in the chat and I'll post, I'll re resend that um, in the follow-up email next week. So sort of it tells you what certifications they use, ingredients, price, vetting. So this is this is this one is the one that we can't necessarily as they align with Healthline's brand integrity standards and approach to well-being. But I don't I don't see any problem with that generally because all these other ones are what's what I was looking for, what were really important to me when I considered this. So this isn't just somebody going, I'm a dietitian and I think these are great. You know, but why do they think those are great? That's what we want to know. And they tell us. Okay. And they're not just trying to sell products. I I'm curious if they're product if they're if what they're doing here is they have affiliate links. So they might, I see this, this goes to an Amazon page. Um, and we might, I don't know if it doesn't say here. Um, let me see if it goes, so it gives you pros and cons. Okay, shop now at Amazon. So these kind of things, this might be an affiliate link. That doesn't mean that this is not credible information, but it's something we consider. If, they, if the other information is not great, if we don't have the how we chose and does the discussion that's actually written by a human being that has considered this, information. If we just have affiliate links, that's not good. But if we have the good stuff and also affiliate links, that I'm not that concerned about. So it might be 
that might be how they make it. I'm going to scroll all the way. Sorry, sorry about the fast scroll. I know the fast scroll makes gives some people uh, challenges related videos. So I'm curious if they if they say that if some of those places like this will have like media store will have disclaimers that they're you know they're using affiliate links. I don't see that here, but I suspect that might be in there. Um, in their about page or something, they probably say that they use affiliate links. Oh, about vitamins. That's a nice frequently asked question about vitamins. I don't like these videos that pop up. So if you if you look at this, you might use the Brave browser or use an ad blocker. I don't have one on this browser. That way you, you won't see these annoying videos popping up. Okay. So that's that's helpful. I I feel like I, I've gone through this. So yeah, to answer the question, um, it's my conclusion, at least based on this very quick overview of this website is that, that this is one that's probably good to look at. What else we got, Lawrence? Um, looks like that's all the questions for the time being. If you have any additional questions, now's the time to post them. And while you're doing that, um, I just wanna post a couple more links. Um, so if you missed part of this video or you want to review it, uh, it will be posted on YouTube. And um, here's the link to our digital literacy playlist on YouTube uh, that also contains um, our previous digital literacy videos in case you want to review those as well. Um, and if you want to sign up for future digital literacy classes and other virtual events, um, you can go to our virtual programming page that's available um, in the link I just posted. And also, uh, we would really appreciate it if you just take a minute or two to fill out our post event survey um, gives us uh, some more information on um, on what you like to see and we like reading your feedback and we do incorporate suggestions uh, into our future programs as well so if you take a minute to fill out the post event survey that'd be much appreciated hey lawrence i see a couple of other questions in the q a i'm just going to do them really quickly if, if you have a moment yeah so there's there's one there they said they saw a large banner advertisement on the website with a lifeguard station at the beach and they want to know if that's cool or lawful and i would say i don't know uh but i have i have two responses one that that might be a studio that might not actually be a real a lifeguard station and number two they may have rented it from department of beaches and harbors or whoever whoever is in charge of that or it might be a private beach so i guess i have three answers for that so the answer is maybe it isn't cool or awful, but I'm I'm sure that they that that they did their due diligence, or at least I hope so. And then uh, the next question I see here is why are affiliate links good or bad? It all comes down to profit motive. So affiliate links, in case you don't know what that is, affiliate links are when you click through. So when a website is promoting a product or talking about a product, and they have a link to the Amazon page for that product, and when you go when you click through using that link, the person who's doing the linking gets a, a tiny kickback from a person either purchasing that product or just going to that website. So they benefit from you um, taking their recommendation. And so the their affiliate links themselves are are neutral. I mean, they're, they're a normal way for blogs and other online entities to make a little bit of money. Um, the, the Where it it's decided whether it's good or bad is if the website is giving you misleading information in order to get you to click on that link because you know obviously the more people click on that link the more they make the more money they make so they so if they're trying to do everything they can to get you to click on that that's not great if it's like i presume healthline but i might be wrong about healthline i mean if healthline if those are affiliate links from Healthline, that but they're providing really good information around it and just giving you the link. Um, then I don't see any. I don't see anything bad about that. I see that as just a normal part of their business. Um, they're providing value for you as a member of the public. You're getting good information from them, and they're getting a little bit of money. And they're providing it for free for you, and they're getting a little bit of money from you clicking on that link. Um, then I, I saw another question about what can you tell us about legit clinical trials, especially if ad doesn't show exact research source. I don't know that much about clinical trials. I would say that it's probably best to know the source 
um, and to find out as much information as you can about the clinical trials. Um, if there's a place where you can communicate with them and ask them questions, to make sure that they give you, they're not, uh, they're not misleading or they're, they're not uh, shy or kind of shady about giving you answers. They'll give you all the answers that you're asking for. And then that you're able to then go and check on those answers yourself. But as a whole, I don't know a whole lot about clinical trials. So maybe Lawrence, do you have anything to add? Oh, you're, Lawrence, you're muted. Uh, no, I don't have that much to add on clinical trials as well. Um, but yeah, definitely try to see if, uh, if you can get more information from them, if they're, if they're withholding um, from the initial article or video. Yeah, if you find out about it from an ad. All right. I think that's, I think that's all for us, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Looks like it. Well, thanks for hosting. And everybody out there, thank you for your questions. Thank you for being here with us listening. And you know, we have the program in Spanish <laughs> next Wednesday about social media, whirlwind tour of social media in Spanish on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So if you know somebody who speaks Spanish or you want to practice your Spanish um, and learn about social media at the same time, you can go into that program. And we're not having a program next Thursday. So the so, you know, we're going to have staff development at that day. So we're not having a program, but the following week, we'll be back with computer basics. Uh, we got a message in the chat. Um, are your emails in particular available online? Uh, my, my work email is not available online, but it's also not a secret. I can just post it in the chat. If you want to email me, you can email me. And when I send the follow-up email, you'll, you'll also be able to see that and respond to it, um, you know, where... We, we interact with the public on a regular basis in events like this, but also by, by email. So if you want to email me, that's absolutely fine. All right. Again, thank you all, and we'll see you next time.